Amen. Well, that was awesome. I say one of my favorite parts of youth camp is listening to you guys sing, man. That was fantastic. What a day that will be when Jesus we shall see. But until then, the importance of getting ready to see him <laughs> is, uh, is uh, ever more appropriate now that we are closer and closer to these last days. And that's why we have these kinds of meetings. It's to prepare you for eternity, to give you an opportunity to do something and hear something uh, with, or to do something with what you hear from the preaching. So take your Bibles tonight, just for a few minutes, go to Proverbs chapter number 7 as a jumping off point. Proverbs chapter number 7. I do want to say you guys have been uh, excellent listeners. It's always kind of been that way. Uh, We've noticed over the years through preaching, and you guys, man, you handle long services, and, uh, and, and and you handle teaching, and you handle preaching so well. And so I just wanted to say I appreciate that. Um, because I know every one of these guys that, get up, that gets up here to preach, they really care about what they're saying. And they want to be a help. And uh, that's why we have uh, the folks preaching who are preaching. And uh, so here in Proverbs chapter number 7, I want to start out by just giving you a, uh, an observation that I've had over some years of kind of watching teenagers and then looking at it in my own life with young people and uh, there's, a, there's, a sad, there's a sad story that takes place in Proverbs chapter 7. You know that? There is, a, there is a, a woman here that is called a strange woman. And she targets out a young man. And while targeting out this young man, what happens is, is she exposes, or the Word of God exposes, the thing that will hinder you from going further with Jesus Christ. As a young person, if you wanted it stewed down to a fine poison, I believe it's right here in these two verses here in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse number 6. The Bible says, for at the window of my house, I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. Now, some of you have heard me say this before, but a young man void of understanding, that's that. Seems like it's negative towards you, like we're picking on you because you're young or something like that. The problem that this young man had was that he did not want to identify what his weakness was. His weakness, just naturally by being young, it's not a knock on you. It's not something to try to beat you over the head with. It's not something that you can accelerate. It's that he did not have enough experience, he did not have enough understanding to see that the decisions he was making at that moment, how they would work out in the future. He had a problem with having the long view when it came to his life. You understand that? He was void of understanding. And because of being void of understanding, she came in and she offered him every good thing that she could. She said, listen, we can have this fun time and there will be no repercussions for our actions. The the, the man's out of the house. Don't worry about it. We're going to take up our fill of love for a night. And you know what ends up happening in this story, sadly enough? This young man, the Bible says, goes after her straightway. And it says that with her flattery, she forced him. And you know what it says? It says, and he knew not that it was for his life. You say, what are we talking about this week? We're talking about hearing God's voice. So what? So that you can live a Christian life. It's about your life. It's not about right now. It's about, wait, 10 years from now. What if the Lord tarries? Listen, I understand we've been saying the Lord could come back at any time. And guess what? He can come back at any time. And you want to know something? You should prepare today in case he doesn't come back for 20 years. You want to know what your weakness is going to be? Is when you say, you know what, those guys up there preaching, they don't really know what they're talking about. And, uh, you know, I know how this thing is going to play out. And I've got enough wisdom. I've got enough understanding. And those guys really don't know what they're talking about. I'm different. I'm different. That's your weakness. And if you fail to recognize that, you're setting yourself up for a world of hurt. And so you know what the Bible does? It's a great thing what the Bible does. The Bible, it gives us, it gives us a peek at the lives of other people so we can learn from them. Does anybody here like, uh, you know, um, like to learn from other people's mistakes? 
I know I have learned the hard way many times. I know me personally, I tend to be pretty thick-headed, and I tend to learn things the hard way all the time. And uh, what I found out is that as I read the Bible, I can kind of save myself a lot of headache if I just listen and obey what the Bible shows me. And uh, you've heard it a couple times this week of Samuel and, uh, and the story of Samuel and how God called Samuel. And we won't go back there right now. We'll probably end up over there. But um, when you find out about Samuel, is Samuel is put in a situation to hear from God because of the sacrifice of his mother. You understand that? You ever read the story of Hannah and how she was barren and how she couldn't have children and, and, uh, and, 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 she, and she beseeched the Lord and she went up to, the, she went up to the, uh, the house of the Lord and of course Eli was there and he thought that she was drunken and she says, no, I'm just sorrowful of heart and she's crying on the altar asking God to give her a son and, and the Lord shows up and gives Hannah the child she was asking for. Now when you see certain scenarios in your Bible that repeat themselves, it's not just a coincidence. What they're doing is they're connecting different things in the Bible so that you can see uh, a lesson there. And as I'm looking through the Bible, you know that there's some other people in the Bible that had the same kind of upbringing that, uh, or had the same kind of family scenario that Samuel had? I'm gonna, I want to try to give you three, just three quick illustrations tonight of people that are, uh, that are connected by that testimony. Their mother being barren and uh, praying to God and the Lord meeting with that woman. And uh, even so much as uh, the, the husband and the wife uh, praying and asking, Lord, how should we raise this child? Coming from parents that really wanted their children to do something for the Lord. Really wanted to make sure their children came out right and did right. And they had a great family unit and, and that kind of thing. And just in... In that, just in that statement right there, there's a lesson. All three that I'm going to show you tonight, all three of them end up differently. And two of them aren't great. You say, what does that tell me? Even though, and I know there's a lot of folks in here that are second, third generation Christians and that kind of thing. Just because you have a great family and you have good parents and you go to a good church and you read your Bible and you have, and you have all these people around you. Right, that want to see you succeed spiritually does not mean that you're going to succeed spiritually. It's not a guarantee. Because you know big name preachers and because you know that uh, uh, your, your, your family prays together and, and, and you've been raised in church since nine months before you're born does not mean that you're going to work out as a Christian. It just not, doesn't mean that. There's no guarantee. You say, yeah, well, I don't have that. I used to think that too. I used to be like, yeah, well, I wasn't raised in a Christian home and I don't have what all these other guys had. And then I read about Josiah and I realized, oh, <laughs> he didn't have a really great home life, did he? <laughs> he had one of the most wicked dads that the nation had ever seen. So it's not, it's not based on the scenario of your home life. What we find out is that every one of these scenarios that the Bible links together for our learning is that they are met with a situation where God speaks to them and they have to make a decision with what God tells them. And based on how they respond to God speaking to them dictates how their life turns out years down the road. What I hope to do tonight is maybe compare and contrast just a few people to maybe help you get the long view and help you to make a decision now that will set you up for the future. Take your Bibles, if you will, just go to Genesis chapter number 25. Genesis chapter number 25. The first, the first person I want to look at tonight is a man by the name of Esau. Now Esau uh, has been mentioned already this week. And uh, of course we know that Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But uh, you have to understand that that statement did not come without any history. You see, you know about Esau. He was, uh, he was the, uh, the brother of Jacob and, and um, Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah was barren and she had a child. And of course, you know that there was two nations in her womb and they were fighting back and forth one with another. And Jacob lays hold on his heel and he comes out and they had to mark it which one was going to have the birthright and uh, all the drama that took place at their birth and everything. And as they grow up, because that's what the Bible says about all three of these characters, it says, and Esau grew. And as he grew up, he finds himself out in the field somewhere doing what he's doing. 
And he gets back, and uh, he's as famished as it gets, and uh, he thinks he's going to die, and he needs something to eat real, real bad. And of course, you know what happens. Jacob, he has some pottage brewing over there, and it's smelling good, and he's got some bread over there, and uh, he's kind of waiting for his brother to come back. And Esau comes in, and you can see him as he's panting and sweating, and he's got this emaciated face, and he's just like, I need something to eat lest I die. Right? And he comes in and Jacob says, uh, hey Esau, how about you, uh, you sell me your birthright and I'll give you some of my food. What do you think? You want to know what I know about the Lord? You know what that birthright had? It didn't just have, it didn't just have worldly uh, assets attached to it. There was a spiritual benefit that came with that birthright. You want to know what happened the minute Jacob opened his mouth and in the head space of Esau, the Lord shows up to Esau. You know what he says? He says, I don't know about that. What do you think? Are you really that hungry? You really that hungry? You really think that it's worth selling off your birthright just for some chili? Because you're hungry? And he says, maybe we should stop and think about this. Maybe this birthright is worth just a little bit more than what you're giving it credit for here in this moment when you're famished and you have these carnal desires and they're burning inside of you and you think that you can't go on and you just have to do it, you have to do it. And his head just starts spinning around and around and around. And you know what? In that next verse, you know what you find out? As he starts to put it in his mind, you know what he tells himself? He says, what does this birthright profit me? And you know what he does? He says, Lord, I'm not going to listen to what you got to say. I am not going to listen to that still small voice inside of my head telling me, hey, wait a minute, you know that's an awful, that's an awful uh, uh, bad trade-off here. Your birthright for a bowl of lentils? What are you doing? Stop. Wait a minute. Let's think about this. There's something greater at play here. Don't you know that this is far greater than just your land and the cows that you see and all the cattle that you have? Don't you think you should just stop and wait a second? Don't you think you should maybe just pause? And he says, what is this profit me? And you know what happens? He swears it over to his brother. And the Bible says that from that day forward, he despised his birthright. He said, I don't want nothing to do with it. And he always looked at his brother like, oh, he got one over on me, got one over on me. And you know what? He decided not to listen to the voice of God. You say, ah, that's just a, you know, just a silly illustration. You want to know what happens later on? Just a chapter or two later, they're growing up and Isaac, his father, starts to get his eyes dim and, and he can't see very well anymore. And you know what happens? He says, you know what, I think it's time I should give a blessing to my children. Let's go ahead and tell Esau to get out there in the field and kill that venison that I like. And why don't uh, you come and prepare me some meat and I want to give you a blessing. And Esau, he scurries around. He's thinking, yeah, this is good stuff, man. I can't wait. I'm finally going to get what's coming to me. And he says, I can bypass that decision I made back there not to listen. Not to listen to God, just to give my birthright away. I'm going to get to circumvent that. And you know what happens? Jacob comes and kills a goat and puts it on his hands and comes in before his father Isaac. And you know what happens? He says, it's the voice of Jacob. It's the voice of Jacob, but it feels like it's Esau. You say, what happens if I decide not to listen to the voice of the Lord? Listen, you can decide not to listen. You can decide to just tune out everything that is said this week, everything that your preacher says, everything that your parents say. But guess what? Don't be surprised when at some time later in life, God allows to happen to you the same thing you did to him. Does that make sense? And you know what the Bible says? That Isaac was deceived because he couldn't discern the voice of Jacob. Just like Esau failed to discern and listen to the voice of the Lord just a few chapters before that. You say, how does it, what's his decision? What's the, what's the implications of his decision? Well, he gets more angry. 
and he's weeping and saying, is there not a blessing for me, Dad? Is there not a blessing for me when he comes back and realizes that Isaac's already given the blessing to his brother Jacob and he was deceived? And he gets really mad. And he says, when the days of mourning for my father are past, I am going to kill my brother. You want to know what happens to a lot of people that just fail? They say, I don't want to listen to the voice of God. I don't want nothing to do with the voice of God. You guys are crazy. I, want, I know what I want, and I'm going to get what I want, and this, is not, this has no benefit to me. The Lord just lets something happen to you so that you can point back and say, look at those Christian people, how they handle and deal with folks, and look at how hypocritical they are, and then he'll let you latch on to that thing. And it'll take you further down and further down and further down and further down. You say, what does that look like? Well, <laughs> a couple chapters later, Isaac telling Jacob to go out there. And he says, don't take of the daughters of the land of Canaan. He says, don't go down there. I don't want you to go down there. Just, just do me a favor. Just, just go over to Padanaram and take it of your, of your mother's brethren and get you, get you a, a wife that way. And you know what Esau does? He sits back and he hears what his father Isaac said and he says, oh, you don't like the women of Canaan, do you? That don't, you don't like that. You don't like that at all, do you? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get back at my father. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to get me some wives out of there and I'm going to show my father exactly what I think of him and his decision and how he didn't treat me right. And he ends his life in a bitter mess. You say, why? Didn't want to listen to God. Can I give you an illustration of a young man that sat in the same exact place that you were sitting several years ago when we first started doing some youth camps? He sat right where you're sitting. Listen to the same kind of preacher you're listening to. And he, someone sent this to me. He made a post. I didn't go looking for it. Somebody sent it over to me. He said, hey, you know this kid? I said, yeah, he was in my youth group about 10 years ago. Sat just where you're sitting. Raised in a Christian home. Played the piano. Sang in the youth choir. He said, having had Christianity shoved down my throat most of my life, to now being on the outside of it looking in is so sad. Sad I lost so much because of it. Friends, family, time, etc. There is really so much I would say on the subject, but I'm just thankful that I'm now able to be who I am and not what a fictitious, manipulative, controlling God wants me to be. My Sunday mornings are for me now. Not for putting on a fake smile to be with a bunch of two-faced people who turn their back on you at the drop of a hat. You know what that sounds like? Somebody that heard God's voice and said, I don't want nothing to do with that. And you know what happened in his life? The Lord allowed somebody to treat him the same way he treated God, and he said, oh. And instead of being able to repent and saying, I did the same thing to God. You know what the Bible says about Esau? It says that he could not find a place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. He was so filled with hate and anger and bitterness that he took that thing and it consumed his life and he could never get the thing straightened out. He got so bitter, he just went off the deep end. You say, oh, that'll never be me. Go ahead and keep shutting down when God talks to you. Go ahead and just say, you know what, that's just crazy. They're just crazy people. You watch what God put in your life. I'm not trying to scare I'm not trying to get on you either. I'm just giving you an example. This is somebody who had an opportunity to listen to God's voice. Can you imagine what the history of your Bible would have been like if you didn't sell his birthright at that moment? Things could look a lot different. Things could look a lot different. You know what you find out? You ever see Christians do some wicked things? You say, I can't believe that Christian could do such a thing. I can't believe that person's saved. That guy who wrote that, he's just as saved as you in here. Just as saved as you in here. I was there when he got saved. And you want to know something? Wickedness that's fueled by bitterness far exceeds wickedness done through ignorance. You look at lost people in the world and you say, oh man, that, listen, that wickedness is understandable. They don't know any better. 
You get a Christian that's been hurt and gets bitter with God and gets bitter with church and gets bitter with people and Christians, the stuff that they can do is unspeakable. That's why when he gives you those lists of the, th- the, the, list of the uh, works of the flesh, he shows you that Christians can do that stuff too. Not only is Esau, you see what happens when you don't listen to the Lord's voice at all, but you also see what happens when you listen to the voice of the Lord, but you just want to do it your way. Go to uh, first, uh, first Samuel, excuse me, uh, first, uh, excuse me, Judges, sorry, Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13, you know what you have here? You got the story of Samson. You know the thing about Samson? His mom, his, his, his father Manoah has a wife and she's barren. She can't have kids. And of course they, they get a meeting with the angel from the Lord. And, and uh, um, it gets to the point where they, they meet with the angel of the Lord again. And he meets with them twice. And, and Manoah says, how should we raise this kid? What should we do? And he says, don't let your wife drink any strong drink or anything unclean. And don't put a razor to that boy's head because he's going to be a Nazarite separated unto God. We got plans for this kid uh, from birth, man. And, uh, of course, you know how it goes. Uh, the child gets up and the child starts to grow. And the Bible says in Judges chapter 13, in that last verse of that chapter, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan. The Lord is just starting to move on a young Samuel. He's just starting to want to talk to him. He's just starting to want to give him some light and start giving him some direction in his life. And then chapter 14 happens. And Samson is gripped with the cares and the affections and the lusts of this world. And it says in verse number 1 of chapter 14, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the, of the Philistines. And told his father and mother, I've seen a woman in Timnath. You know what he had? He had a problem with his eyes. He was looking at a bunch of stuff. He had seen a bunch of things that the world had to offer because it was in front of him constantly, 24-7, scrolling, 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 scrolling. I want this, and I want this, and I want this. And you know what? When does he want it? He says, now, therefore, get her for me to wife. I want it not. I don't just want it. I want it now. I want what I want now. Does that sound familiar to any of the sermons you've heard yet this week? I want it now. I want a wife now. I want to be out there now. I want to have my independence now. No one can tell me what to do. And you know what? His dad comes to him. His dad comes to him and he says, you know what? Is there ever a time you can pick a a woman of your own people? And you know, right at that moment, I think the Lord steps in. And he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he steps into Samson's uh, headspace and he says, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't you think you should listen to your parents? Don't you think that maybe you should take this advice? Don't you think that maybe they know a little bit more than you do? Don't you think you should slow down and just kind of maybe put this stuff on the back burner? Hey, listen, I can get you a wife in due time. Why don't you just chill out for a minute? You know what Samson says? He says, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. She pleaseth me well. He says, you know what? I'm not opposed to having, you know, God in his place and doing what God, you know, just kind of the the, the motions of what God wants me to do. But at the end of the day, you know what I want? I want what I want and I want it now. And he says, give her to me now. And so his parents go down there and he gets her. And you know what you find out as you read through the rest of Samson's life? He starts doing the same thing everybody else is doing in the world. He goes down to the Philistines, the land of the Philistines. And you know what the Bible tells you in verse number 10? He says, so his father went down under the woman woman, and Samson made there a feast for so used the young men to do. He just started doing what everybody else was doing. No big deal. Everybody's doing it. The world's doing it. No big deal. I don't care. It's just normal stuff. I don't want to be different. I just want to go down there and have what I want when I want it. 
And then when he's met with situations, you know what he does? He doesn't rely on the Spirit of God to dictate his answers. You know what he does? He tries to operate off of his own intellect. He tries to operate off of just what he knows. He just shoots off his mouth because of something that he saw on YouTube. He just starts telling people what he Googled. He starts to try to be, a, he starts to try to be an intellectual of sorts. You know what shocks me in the last five years when talking with young people? It seems like more and more of you are attracted to this intellectual stuff that you're seeing on YouTube. And you want to come to older preachers and you want to debate them on complex issues in the Bible. And guess what? You've not mastered the simple things of the Bible yet. And so Samson, you know what he does? He's just relying on his intellect. He's just relying on whatever comes to him. He says, I'm just going to give you a riddle. See if you can get my riddle. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and play these little word games with you. I'm just going to go ahead and, and, uh, and just, just go off of what I know. You know what finds out? He looks just like a lot of Christians do today. In chapter 14, verse 18, he finds himself after slaying a thousand men with a jawbone of an ass. He becomes sore of thirst. And you know what he says? He says... Lord, I need something to drink. Don't, don't you know I've been doing all this stuff for you? Do you want me to fall into the, in, uh, in the midst of all these Philistines? I need something to drink. And you know the Lord graciously, you know what he does? He opens up a well out of that jawbone and gives him something to drink. You know what he's just like a lot of Christians that put God where they want to put God and they only talk to God when they need something. Is that the kind of life you want? Is that the kind of Christianity you want? You just talk to God whenever you find yourself in a pickle somewhere? In chapter 16, you know what happens? He has two more relationships. You know what his relationships are? They're always one-sided and very shallow. He sees, a, he sees a harlot down in Gaza. He has her, and through his own manipulation, he gets what he wants out of her. It's one-sided, very shallow. And then he meets Delilah, and the Bible says he loves her. And you know what happens? She does everything she can and manipulates Samson and manipulates Samson to get out of him what she wants. And he doesn't know what true love it is. He doesn't know what a real relationship is. How in the world could you know that if you don't have God in the center of the thing? Is that the kind of relationships you want? Some of the closest relationships you have are the ones that center around Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I don't want relationships like that. I don't want a life like that. Just have God where I have him and I can, you know, only three times in the chapter, in, in, in the book, does it say that God moved on Samson. Do you think God only wanted to move on him three times in his life? All the setup that God did in his life, the things he did with his parents, you think that God only wanted to move on him three times? I don't think so. You know what's the problem? He said, I didn't want to listen to God. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I'm not, I'm not opposed to the Lord, but you know what? I just, I, I, I like what I like. And this world is awful alluring. You'd be surprised how far you'll get in life with shallow relationships and doing what everybody else is doing and just relying on your intellect until you find yourself in a situation like Samson found himself in when he makes a mistake and shoots his mouth off just a little too much and tells her just a little bit too much and all of a sudden he wakes up and he thinks that he's going to be able to take care of it just like he had in times past and you know what? He didn't realize that God wasn't with him anymore. And the moment you think you need God the most, and I don't know how long of a time that will be from the time you say, I'm, I, I just put God where I want Him, but sometime in your life you're going to find yourself and realize I'm not smart enough to handle this situation. And I sure wish I had a, I sure wish that I had a relationship that would go with me through this hard time that I'm coming with. You want to know something? You listen to these guys up here talk about the hard times. You want to know what makes them palatable? Is they've got women on, their, on, uh, on the side of them that are with them through thick and thin. They've got friends that are with them through thick and thin. Those relationships go far deeper than just shallow roots. They're rooted and grounded in Christ. And they help them get through those things. Samson's all by himself. Samson finds himself in a situation where, guess what? Everybody that he was doing everything with is no longer there. He's by himself. And when he calls out to God, he hears a faint cricket in the distance because God's nowhere near him anymore. You say, how does Samson's life end? His life ends with his eyes being put out, grinding in the midst of his enemies, 
making fun of him and laughing at him. Oh, look at you, big tough guy. Thought you were so smart. You imagine Samson walking around. He walked around. He was so cocky. He just thought he was something special, man. He walked around like, I could just whoop you, and, and you don't know me, and wish you knew my parents, and look what all I've accomplished, and realizing that it's just all flesh. God was really just being merciful to him. And he leans in the last bit of, of uh, compassion that he's shown in his life. There's a young boy that comes and he says, hey, will you put my hands on the pillars? I need to rest in just a second. And in that moment, at the end of his life, with his eyes put out and he can't see anything, he finally sees clearly for the first time in many, many years. And he says, you know what he says? Lord, use me this one time. You know what he did? He realized that he went through an entire life putting God where he wanted him to be and allowing himself to really be on the throne of his life. And he realized that all those accomplishments were rooted in self. I want to avenge myself. I want to do this for me. Did you cross me? I'm going to get you back. Yeah, the Lord used him in spite of him. I don't want the Lord to use me in spite of me. I want the Lord to use me because... Uh, because I want, him, I want him to use me because I love him. I want him to use me because I'm submitted to him. I don't want him to use him in spite of me. And you know what happens? He dies in the midst of his enemies in the world who are making fun of him. You know, I've watched some Christians die like that. They were in church for 30, 40, 50 years, and they just got, and they just would live in the way they wanted to live, and they weren't necessarily wicked and doing wicked things necessarily, but they just, they just never really got in, and they ended up, you know, thinking they knew everything, and they walked around, and because of their cockiness and because of their attitude, they ended up naturally pushing everybody away, and you know what? When it came time to die, they died alone because nobody wanted to come see them. I don't want that. Is that, how, is that what you want? Some of you in here, you're in that situation right now. You know what you're, you're, doing, what you're doing? You're playing back and forth. What am I going to do with what God's saying to me? You know, you've been told exactly what to do. You've been told exactly what to do. You've been told how to do it. He told you that this morning. Submit to him. Submit yourself to him. And you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to make a decision. The last one. Of course, you know it. It's been read already. Samuel, young boy, laying in bed. The Lord comes in and says, Samuel, Samuel. And, of course, you know how the story goes. He goes to Eli a couple times, and he says, listen, he says again, just go ahead here, my Lord. Right? And he does that. You say what happens. By the end of the chapter, the Bible says that Samuel was growing, right, in favor with God and with men, and all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that he was set up to be a prophet of Israel. And you know what happens to Samuel? He has the privilege of being the spiritual leader to an entire nation that God calls the apple of his eye. Samuel has the privilege of anointing two kings, and one of them being the greatest king that ever ruled over the nation of Israel. Samuel dies beloved of Israel. What a testimony. You say, if I put those three men and gave you their testimonies and gave you how their lives end based on how they responded to God's voice, you say, that's a no-brainer. The easy pick is Samuel. Who wouldn't want that? Could I submit to you that actually Samuel's decision may have been the hardest? say, what are you talking about? In order for Samuel to have heard God's voice, do you realize what that cost him? You think that it was easy for Samuel to just say, here, Lord, have me. I'll do what you want me to do. Did you ever consider that in order for him to hear God's voice and to respond to God's voice the way he did, that he had to control the inputs in his own life? You know what, that, you know what the passage tells you? You've heard it read two or three times this week that he was laying in his bed to go to sleep. Just thinking in quietness. Thinking about what he'd heard and what he'd seen in the temple and working with Eli and all the stuff he was doing. He was controlling. He wasn't being bombarded with all these different voices. He had time to think. You say, what are we trying to get across to you today? Some of you don't even know how to go to sleep without a screen in your face. 
You say, what is that? Those are inputs. Those are voices. Those are things that are going in and they're not allowing you to hear things properly. Do you understand? Some of you, listen, I'm all for music. I am music kind of guy, right? Some of you listen to music so much, you realize that's an input. Even the good stuff. You can't just constantly bombard yourself with music. Why? You need time to let God get in your head and think a little. How are you going to hear him if all you've got is stuff going in? Samuel understood. Samuel was in a position where he was unplugged. But he was always ministering. The Bible says several times in there that he was ministering as what? As a child. Doing what he's supposed to do. Ministering. Putting the right things in. Keeping the bad things out. You think that's easy? Everybody in here knows that ain't easy, don't you? I bet you most of you in here, one of the reasons you've been at this altar is because you're, because you're struggling with some kind of input in your life. And you realize it's a lot harder to control than what you thought it was. And Paul says, I will not be brought into the power of any. And you know what you realize? You thought you could dabble in something, and now it's got its claws in you, and you can't get rid of it, and you're addicted to it, and you're like, I don't know what to do now, and you're freaked out. Because you know it. Because that's what it's designed to do. Think it's easy? You say, I want to I wanna make a decision like Samuel. Can you control the inputs in your life? You know what else he had to do? He had to learn how to submit to leadership that he knew was flawed. You don't think he knew the foolishness of Eli? You don't think that that was the talk of the church? Oh, Eli's boys, they ain't no good and he ain't doing nothing about it. And you don't think that Samuel was shrewd enough to be able to see because he was close enough to the guy that was in charge that he could see the flaws in them. You know what he did? He submitted to him anyway. You guys want to know some of your problem in here? You think you know more than the authorities that are over you, and you refuse to submit to them, and you have a problem with authority. You have a problem with the authority of your parents. You have a problem with the authority of your teachers. You have a problem with the authority of your preachers, and you wonder why God ain't speaking. Listen, some of you boys have no problem chesting up to a preacher messing around. Think I could take you in a fight? What is wrong with your brain? What gives you the audacity to do that? Listen, I've, listen. some of you girls, you give a look to a, to, uh, to a person in authority, you give a look to them that'll just drop them dead like that. You ain't going to tell me. What are you talking about? Who are you? You ever get a lady like that and she says, oh, well, you just don't know who I am. You're like, oh, please, sister, (laughs) really? Some of you talk just like that. You talk just like that. You walk around and you're and and, and you're just constantly just bucking authority. You ain't gonna tell me I can't have electronics. I'll show you. You say, ah, I want God to speak to me. Do you? You thought Samuel's decision was the easy one? How about trying to submit to somebody? Listen, some of you in here, you do have parents that have flaws. And the Bible tells you to submit to him anyways. You have the character to do that? Samuel did. God spoke to him. You say, what else did he have to do? Last thing and I'll let you go. You ready? He had to endure the ridicule of his peers. Oh, you think Hophni and Phinehas didn't have their way with Samuel? You think Hophni and Phinehas didn't think that, oh, look at you. Your mommy come your mommy come give you your new coat little preacher boy huh making fun of his relationship with his family with his parents right oh you you're just so cute in your new coat mommy just loves you doesn't she coming around and whoa why don't you just go ahead and come do what we're doing why don't you hang out with us? What, you too good? You just, you just holier than thou, Samuel, just walking around, doing everything you're told. You just think you're perfect. You just think you're spotless. You just think you're better than us, don't you, Samuel? You're just too good, huh? Making fun of him. Making fun of his relationship with the preacher and his, and his commitment to the church. 
Oh, every time offerings come and you just got to be there to help out. You just got to do this. While well, they're taking it and taking the offering. And they desp- the Bible says they despise the offering of the Lord. You think that was easier for Samuel to just keep his head down and say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, think I'll, I don't think that's probably good for me to do. Oh, you think your mommy's going to give you a coat? You, your mommy going to, you know, is she going to come pamper you again this year? He says, yeah, I love my mom. I do appreciate her. She's done a lot for me. You should, see, you should see the sacrifice she made for me to be here. You think that was easy for him to do? You want to know why some of you won't make that decision? You want to know why that decision is so hard for you to make? Because you're worried about what somebody else is going to think about you when you go say, no, you know what? I'm not going to get on that thing anymore. And no, I'm not going to talk like that anymore. And no, I don't want to go there anymore. And no, I don't want to. And you start changing things in your life. You're worried about what they're going to say about you. You think Samuel's decision was the easiest decision? You're crazy. But I will say this. What it shows us is that the right decision is one of delayed gratification. You want to know something? God gives you an opportunity to hear His voice and to say, Lord, whatever you want, I will do. God gives you an opportunity to say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm sick of... I'm sick of listening to all of them. I'm sick of that. And yeah, the people that I'm, that, you know, my parents have got flaws. Everybody's got flaws. I've got flaws, Lord. But you know what? You told me to submit to them. I'm going to submit to them. Lord, listen, I, I know I'm not perfect. And I just, I just, I just want to stop doing some of this. I want to get some of this stuff out of my life. You want to know why you guys are having such a hard time? There's not, I, listen, I say this. It'd be, I'd be shocked if some of you said, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and take a hiatus from some of the social media stuff because it's causing me a lot of problems. Some of you in here don't have the character to do that. You say, well, it's never going to go away. Has it got its grips on you? I want to hear God's voice. Do you? You want to know why I think this is so important? When I was 18 years old, I was at a youth camp. You know what God did? God told me to go to Bible college and changed my life. Chain, listen to me. When I say changed my life, I won't give you the, gr- the gritty details of what I was doing before that, that youth camp because I don't want to talk like that. But I'm going to tell you something. God in a youth camp, not a good youth camp. He used a bad youth camp to show me that this is where it was going to go. And God said, you need to go to Bible college. If you think there's something wrong with these guys, then you better go learn the Bible if you think you're going to know more than them because I didn't know nothing. And I packed my car and I drove 26 hours to Pensacola, Florida, and God in a youth camp spoke to me and changed my life. It was at a youth camp in Alabama, second year of Bible college. God came and knocked on my heart's door again and said, hey, what do you think about preaching? I said, God, I can't do that. I got nothing to say. I don't even know how church works. I was, I, didn't, I was so oblivious, I didn't even know God called people to do stuff. That was a different concept for me. And God, you know what he did? He called me to preach at a youth camp. About nine years ago, at a youth camp, there was some stuff going on in the ministry I was in. And man, it was a hard decision. And I won't go into the details, but you want to know what God did? I had a couch at a youth camp. God came and spoke to me and said, you got to leave. And you know what he did? God redirected my life. You say, why? Because I was able to hear his voice and decided to listen to it at a youth camp. You say, yeah. We won't take my testimony. Don't take my testimony. Suppose we brought these three guys up we just talked about. Suppose Esau was standing here before you tonight. You say, hey, what do you think about this? The stuff they're preaching, what do you think I should do? He say, I wish I'd have listened. Suppose you brought Samson up here tonight and say, hey, Samson, give me some advice. These guys are talking about making a decision and, you know, submitting and, humbling myself and doing what God wants me to do, listening to his voice. You know what he said? I wish I'd have done it sooner. And you bring Samuel up here, 
with a smile on his face and walking real, you know, staggered steps. Say, Samuel, give me some advice about listening to the voice of the Lord. He says, I remember listening to the voice of God and it was better than I could have ever wished for. Because the life that God allowed me to live was greater than anything I ever had to give up for Him. It is not even worthy to be compared. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight again. I pray, Lord, that you continue to bless this service as we continue through. And I pray you continue to speak to these that are here. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Adam, why don't you guys come up with your group? Sing a couple songs and then... Dr. Peacock can come. <laughs>